one of our foundation passages um, in Paul's second letter to Timothy. And we're going to read a few verses to, again and emphasise some aspects of it that, that uh, we want to show how strong and how powerful this particular scripture really is. So you're uh, aware of it, you know it, you learned it at Sunday school, if you were in Sunday school, it is a very important scripture. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and those words um, given by inspiration of God, as I'm sure many of us are aware, uh, for, is what, it's one Greek word, or two Greek words fused together, theonoustos, and it means literally God breathed, it has come from God, and, and it it is very powerful because it tells us that everything, all scripture, or all graphic, all the writing, and it's referring clearly to the Old Testament because Paul was speaking to, writing to Timothy, and he was saying that from a child he had known the Holy Scriptures, which were able to make him wise unto salvation. And the Holy Scriptures were, the, that was the Old Testament that Timothy had access to or was aware of their content. And so as we read on in this, in this uh, section of scripture, we find that there are four items there that are listed by the Apostle Paul under inspiration himself to encourage Timothy, and it's recorded for our learning. So there's doctrine or teaching, as we truly understand that, reproof or evidence, or um, it's used in, in John where uh, the Holy Spirit, uh, the Comforter, is spoken of. And where one of the functions of the comforter is to convict the world of sin. And that's the same word as reproof. Uh, and then we have the idea of correction. And it has the idea of making straight. Now, there is an interesting illustration in one of the miracles of Jesus, which I think is worth us thinking a little bit about. It's the woman who was taken with an infirmity. And if you remember, the record tells us she was bowed down. She was stooped over. She, she was looking at the ground all the time. And Jesus healed her and she was made straight. And that's the same word. And what she did immediately was glorify God. And I wonder whether there's a powerful lesson for us here. In that one of the aspects of the word of God is to make us straight. And when we read from scripture and find that there are things which we have left undone or things which we are doing wrong and we know we should be doing them right and it's made us straight our immediate reaction should be to to glorif to glorify God in the way that that she did and finally it mentions therefore instruction in righteousness now you may be aware and you may be using the revised version translation of the scriptures there's a problem with that in, in this particular verse, and I just want to show you how careful we have to be and how our, our, our practice as Christadelphians in going back to the original scriptures, the original writings, the original languages is so important. And the RV reads something like this for verse 16, every scripture inspired by God is also profitable. So what we are being told there possibly is that... Um, Every scripture inspired by God. That doesn't really say all scripture is given by inspiration of God, does it? It leaves the door open, possibly, for some of the writings not to be inspired. But the problem with that translation is that there's just a little word in the Greek, the word kai, and it's the word and. And in their translation, they have no place for it at all. And that changes the sense completely. So it's so important, isn't it, to be sure that what we read we has what we read in our language is as faithful to the original as we possibly can be um, i'm sure you know this but just in case there's anyone who doesn't know it uh, a, a translation of the scriptures like the king james version for example where you've had the word Ita in, in italics they're not actually in the original they put there to give the sense and very often they do but at least it tells us that the translators have put these words in to help us to try and understand scripture we need to be aware of that and i believe that when we do quote scripture and i've tried to do this as much as i can is to reflect that so you do hopefully see the italics that are occurring there so we know what we are uh, what we have here 
in front of us uh, has been um, modified in some way by the translators, but we are aware of it all. So let's just look at another fundamental passage. I want to come back to Timothy in a second, but let's look at another fundamental passage of Scripture, which is in um, 2, 2 Peter. And again, just like the other Scripture, this is so well known amongst us. But it tells us that the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. It's Peter's second letter, chapter 1, verse 21. And, and the two words used there, came and moved, are the same in, in the Greek. And it's the word uh, phero, and it means being born along. And it's useful to just see what that means if we go to Acts chapter 27. Uh, and this is the way we can understand uh, what God has inspired for our learning, is to, is to compare Scripture with Scripture, as I no doubt will come out time and time again today. If we take the, the reference in Acts 27, we'll just look at those two verses there. And it's the time when Paul is in a storm on the Mediterranean Sea. And in verse 15, we read this. When the ship was caught and we could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive, or we were borne along. That's the same word that, that is there in the Greek. And then verse 17 which when they had taken up, they used helps, undergirding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into quicksands, strake sail and were so driven. Were driven is the same word. So you can see that the ship had no power to control itself. The wind was driving it in a certain way. It couldn't resist the force of the wind. And that's what God is saying about the prophecy. It came to holy men of God. They couldn't resist it. It came to them. And so that's the conclusion that we have to draw, really, from that scripture, isn't it? That, that when the Almighty saw fit to breathe into his servants, the minds of his servants, his words for the purpose of being written or spoken, such a force was impossible for them to resist, causing them only to speak the words that God gave them. And there are interesting examples that we could bring, and we haven't got time to turn them up, but, but you know what they are. In 1 Kings chapter 13, you know, the, the old prophet, that the man of God who went out from Judah to Bethel, the old prophet said, don't go straight back, as he was instructed to do, come and stay with me. And, and the, the, the prophet that went out from Judah to Bethel did stay with the man and disobeyed God. And then the prophet, the old prophet, who had misled him, without foreseeing what would happen, the scriptures tell us the word of the God came to him and told him what was going to happen to the man of God who went out from Judah to Bethel, that he would die, and that's exactly what happened. What about Caiaphas? When Caiaphas prophesied, he didn't even know he was prophesying, but he did prophesy. God caused him to prophesy, to utter those words in John chapter 11. And Balaam as well. He didn't desire, did he, to say the things to, the, the, uh, to, to Balak about Israel. Balak wanted him to curse, but Balaam was forced to bless. And so there's the force of the power of God when people might be compliant or non-compliant that comes upon individuals and they are unable to resist. So going back to the passage in in uh, Timothy, we have expanded it, expanded it to show that, of course, it's clear that we are uh, speaking about those things which Timothy had learned from a child, and these things can make us wise unto salvation. That's how important this subject is. It's not a matter of just interest. It's not a matter that we can have a casual approach to. It's a matter which is fundamentally important for us. It, they can make us wise and to salvation. And the verse that I've highlighted there, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works, is interesting to compare with a verse in Jeremiah's day. Because Jeremiah was striving to speak the right words from God to the people and he wasn't really getting very far because the people were accepting the words of the false prophets rather than the words of of Jeremiah 
And so Jeremiah was inspired to say this, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the, Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you, they make you vain. Now can you see the difference? The false prophets who didn't speak the words of God, who weren't driven along to utter God's words, all they can possibly do is make the people vain. But the word of God, where God inspires men to write his words, they can make the man of God, the man who is prepared to devote his life to the teaching of God, perfect, truly furnished, and to all good works. And it's interesting, isn't it, that in that section in Timothy, that it goes on to warn about false prophets. So we've got a similar situation in Peter, where we've highlighted this time the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. And that's interesting, isn't it? Because that same verse in Jeremiah can be compared with Peter. And what Jeremiah is inspired to say there is that they speak a vision of their own heart. And they were making up prophecies to try to encourage the people to listen to them. In fact, you read on in Jeremiah 23, we won't go there now, but there's an illustration, a verse says, where the prophet says, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. But of course they hadn't been given a dream from God. They had dreamed up something themselves, that they were um, speaking to the people. And it was of no profit whatsoever. So, let's then remember how important the, the words of God are and, the, and their value. Now, I will be pushing a few publications as we um, go through the afternoon, because there are certain things that I've read in, in my own experience which I've found so wonderfully helpful, and, and it's this uh, that I'd like to come on to now. Um, I'm not sure when I managed to get a copy of this, but it certainly wasn't when it came out in 1982, it's more like 10 years or so later. But this is one of the testimony special issues. And we've got an editor's testimony here, so I'm no doubt I'm at Brownie Point Four for <laughs> mentioning it. But I was so struck by by this opening paragraph of the uh, introduction to this particular issue that I think it is worth sharing with you. Now, if you I don't think there are any copies left of this particular issue, but of course it's all now electronically available. And so this is what it says. It's, it's, to me, it's on a parallel with the opening of Elpis Israel, actually, these words. So they're, 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 I think they're that good. The inspiration of Scripture is a doctrine of vital importance. For a belief in a holy inspired Bible is the very foundation of the Christadelphian faith. If the words of the Bible are not the words of God, then the biblical basis for the truth as we understand it is no reliable basis at all. And the Christadelphian statement of faith is a document with its roots in stony ground. If we cannot, with absolute certainty as to its divine origin and production, turn to the Bible as the word of God, then we are at sea without a compass, adrift without a helm, and unsure as to every effort we may make to progress toward enlightenment in spiritual things. No, I think that really does set it out, doesn't it? Is this book that we have and that we read wholly reliable, wholly inspired by God? Can we have that much confidence in it? Well, I hope that by the end of today that that's what we will most assuredly be of one mind on. Now, we have had problems in our community over this particular subject. And we don't want to dwell on this, but... That picture there is of um, someone by the name of Robert Ashcroft, who became a brother in 1876. In fact, in the July 1876 Christadelphian, there's a, a large portion of information where it's headed up, a Congregationalist minister becomes obedient to the truth, unrevs himself, and gives up a salary of £400 a year, which by today's standard, as far as I can work out, is 182400 which is not too bad. So he gave up that, which is an immense sacrifice, and it appears that in the early days of his sojourn in the truth that he was a very valuable brother. But and Robert Roberts um, created for him 
the post of assistant editor of the Christadelphian, and he was for just under two years uh, assistant editor of the Christadelphian. And then in 1884, in September, there was an announcement in the Christadelphian where Robert Ashcroft uh, his, announced his intention to start a, a new monthly periodical entitled The Exegetist. The biblical exegetist, which I intend, he says, for circulation mainly among scholars and students of the alien type. Well, that might be okay so far, but then when we get to the uh, this intelligence item, where it was quite common to report where prominent speakers were speaking and their subjects that they were speaking on, and. Uh, he was lecturing in Swansea on the 21st of September 1884 with this subject, inspiration, its necessity, that's fine, isn't it? Its nature, that's also probably okay, and its limits. Now, that isn't okay, is it? Because what he's suggesting there is that inspiration has limits. What God has breathed out can be limited in some way. And he had some theories on this. And in the only issue of Ashcroft's magazine... He wrote an article called Theories of Inspiration. And we're going to look at a couple of things that he said, that's all. We could say quite a lot, but there was a lot of controversy which followed this, and it led to a division in the Christadelphian community. And it led to ecclesias adopting a new clause that they'd never had before in their statement of faith. And as Brother Paul has already mentioned and read this, uh, the foundation clause. I won't read it again, but maybe... By the time we go home, we'll know it off by heart. Uh, it, it, it sets out what Christadelphians believe, and it appends to that the scriptures that have been used to draw together that particular clause. And it was never there before. It was added to the Statement of Faith in 1886. Now, call it there, the Statement of Faith. You might say, well, now he's a Birmingham amended Statement of Faith. In 1886, it wasn't amended at that point. So it was known as the Birmingham Statement of Faith, which Ecclesias adopted. So I won't read that again, but that is our, um, our driving force, isn't it? That's what we believe. Now, in his article, he was trying to to um, explain what he meant by inspiration. And this is what caused all the problem. And this is what we need to be very careful about. He said, we apply a much more reasonable canon of interpretation to the sacred writings when we so far overcome our timidity as to acknowledge in them the presence of a human as well as a divine element. So that's what mainly caused the problem. He th thought that the scriptures were put together, not wholly given by inspiration of God, but they contained some thoughts of men. Now, if they contain some thoughts of men, then they're liable to err. Uh, men make mistakes. God doesn't make a mistake. And then that's a real problem, isn't it? Because we can't be clear as to, well, what this word is saying to us. Which bits come from man and which bits come from God? And then if we are able to sort that out, which we can't, but if we were then we would say, well, the bits from man then, uh, which bits are wrong and which bits are right? So you really have a, a problem opened up to you. But, but that was what he thought. And in fact, he had this, um, this uh, analogy here of uh, the bridge. And he said, well, salvation is a bit like crossing a bridge. So we're on one side of the bridge and we, we, we're mortal. We, we're not going to be saved, we're going to die. We need to get somewhere else where we can be in a position where we can be saved. And the Bible will allow us to be saved. Now we can get across that bridge, but that bridge may have lots of bits of other materials that, that, that go to, um, to make it up, boats and so on. And in each of those there may be little defects here and there, but that doesn't really matter because we can still walk across the bridge. Now that's what he thought. And uh, that's what he said, in fact. It's not intended that we test the soundness of every boat and link in the chain which supports the bridge we may wish to, we may wish to cross, and so on. Maybe a hundred floors, but it's strong enough to get us over to the other side. Now, it, you can see how some people can be swayed by that kind of argument. I can remember to being uh, in conversation with a couple of Mormons many, many years ago. And, of course, when you talk to Mormons, the subject goes around the Book of Mormon, doesn't it? And what they say is important, and what we say is not important at all. 
And, and I was told that, well, um, you need the Book of Mormon because if you hang a picture on the wall or something on the wall, you knock a nail into it, and we could do it like that, it can move you from side to side if you just put one nail on the top. But if you put a nail on the bottom, then it's, it's firm, it's, uh, it's, it won't move. So the top nail is the Bible and the bottom nail is the Book of Mormon. Now you can see how some people could be swayed by something like that. But it's crazy, it's ridiculous, isn't it? It's an analogy which is dreamed up, just like this bridge analogy, which has no foundation whatsoever. However, God does give us pictures and he does give us analogies. So let's look at a God-given analogy now and find out what God's view is. Now God says in his word, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. When we're told in one of the Psalms, the words of the Lord are pure words, silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. We're also told, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. And another quotation, thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. Now those words that I've highlighted there in blue, it's all the one Hebrew word, sarap, to, and it means to refine. That's the idea behind the word. So, so where is the analogy that we're going to get from scripture? And it's the work of a refiner of silver. And so what we are being told is, yes, there are analogies that we can use from maybe everyday life, but they're ones that God gives us. They have to be sound. They have to have a basis. And so what God is telling us, I believe, in these scriptures here, is that God has selected, carefully selected, every word and inspired people to write those down. That's what we're being told. Every word of God is pure. It's gone through a process. And the process is likened to the refining of silver. And so you get silver ore, which is melted down, and there's the refiner. And, and Malachi tells us that they sit down. And you wonder why they're sitting down. They're sitting down because it takes a while for everything to be sorted out. And, and uh, as we're told from um, one of those uh, quotes, this one here, purified seven times. So maybe that process has to be uh, undergone a number, of, a number of times to get the pure silver metal coming through. So if God is telling us that's what he's done to put his word together, then we really can't afford to discard anything that is there in scripture. We have to take it that these are the words that God has given to us and they're so important, they're so fundamental for us. Every word has been refined. He has selected these words. Well, what about the process then of inspiration? Verbal inspiration is what we effectively <coughs> Believe If every word of God has been inspired, then he has given every word to the prophets and they have either spoken them initially and then written them down or just written them down in the first place. That's what I believe those verses are, are telling us. So he's arranged circumstances where he's conveyed to men and they're instructed to write down the very words they've received. And Hosea tells us, that the way in which God has communicated to men is by the spoken word. He's done it through visions and he's done it through similitudes. And we're also told in the letter to the Hebrews that God had at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. So, the spoken word, we've got many examples of that in scripture, don't we? Thus saith the Lord, that, that is very common scripture that comes to us. Uh, visions. So what do we think about visions? Well, there are things like the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. But those visions were turned into words that God gave to Isaiah to, to write down. And that's what we have. We have the words of, of God. And the um, uh, similitudes, well, that word um, is the Hebrew word dama. It, uh, it gives you an example of that in Psalm 102. There's a reference to, I am like a pelican in, in the wilderness. Uh, 
and that um, like is that similitude that's the word similitude so we get a picture that God gives to us and from that he is expecting us to learn something from what he said and there's a number of examples of that in the Song of Solomon so our view of scripture is that it is uh, verbally inspired or plenary inspiration and that is full complete entire absolute and qualified now Robert Ashcroft didn't take this view he contended that if we uh, accept the doctrine of verbal inspiration he said we have a problem because we would expect a level of uniformity of diction in the scriptures and because that level of uniformity is not there he has concluded, well, no, that can't possibly be the case. Well, we'll answer, tr- answer that one. And then he says, if there were but one doubtful passage, it could no longer be said that every word in the book was inspired. And then the final point, inspiration covers everything in the scriptures that may have been beyond the power of man to discover for himself. Now, if you think about that one for a minute, everything that we couldn't work out for ourselves would be inspired by God, according to Robert Ashcroft, but the other things would not be. Well, there'd be a vast amount, wouldn't there, of the Bible that man could possibly find out for themselves. There would be a lot there, and we wouldn't know whether it was right or not, because man is liable to err and to make mistakes. We wouldn't be able to trust it. So we've really got a problem if we accept his, his view. So let's just kind of look at a couple of things now. Our verbal inspiration, the style of the, the writer. He's saying that um, a, a level uniformity of diction would have been the result of verbal inspiration. And because it isn't there, he's saying it can't possibly be verbally inspired. Now, he's making a very big presumption. He's saying, well, God can only write in one style. That's what he's basically saying. All has to be the same. Well, you can't say that to God, can you? God can choose to do whatever he wants to do. So we can't possibly accept that kind of thing. Now I've got a couple of quotes here. The first quote is from a book which was written in 1840, which I'm going to give you some details on in a second, by Louis Gorson, a, 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 a French Swissman, Swiss Frenchman or whatever. And uh, this is what he says. And, and it's a, it's a, a, a well-known uh, book, very well-known sets out the doctrine of verbal inspiration very, very powerfully. And Robert Roberts was very impressed by that at the time of the inspiration crisis. Some parts of that were put into the Christadelphian magazine in, the 18, in 1885. The question, he says, is, is, is about the words and not about the men who wrote them. As to the latter, that concerns you little. The spirit was able, more or less, to associate with their individuality, their conscience, their recollections, their affections, with what he caused them to write. And you are in no wise obliged to know how far this was the case. So in other words, it's not your business to know about um, the individuals in that sense. You need to concentrate on the words of Scripture. That's what he's basically saying, isn't it? God did it. Whatever it means he used, he did it. And these are the words, and that's what he wants us to concentrate on. Brother Stephen Palmer, in that special issue in July 82 of the Testimony magazine, said this, Literary style assertions divert attention away from the message revealed towards speculations about the writer that can never be proved. If we're going to try to analyse the style of certain people, and think that therefore they wrote them and they had a hand in inspiration somehow, then you are being driven away from the actual words themselves that are being explained to us and written for our learning. And he says you can't prove it anyway. So we just want to forget about it really, about the idea of style. And in this book, Our Sure Foundation, that um, Brother Paul mentioned at the beginning, over, not quite over, just under half the book, there are articles by Brother Peter Watkins. I commend those to you. I had a, an early copy of, of the text of that book, and, and I believe that those articles in particular are extremely useful for the most part. And what he does say is what the Bible does claim is that the writers wrote exactly what God required. 
but we are not asked to believe that the writers were mere writing machines. In some mysterious way, God worked through the minds of the inspired writers. God knew exactly what he wanted to say and how he wanted it said. With infinite skill, he chose the right men and used them in the right way. So he suggests that the process of revelation by God to men chosen by him is past finding out, but he still emphasises, and this is the important thing, that God knew exactly what he wanted to say and he was choosing the right men whom he wanted to inspire. And so if there's any human element at all in inspiration, it seems to me to be in the choice of the person through whom God wanted to convey his message. And if I can try and um, look at uh, some examples of that, and this is considering now where the argument depends on the writer. Now, we haven't got time to, to turn, again, these references up. Hopefully I can just convey enough about them so we can get the point. I've got three quotes here, three distinct references, uh, in the, all from the New Testament and all about David, and they're all quoting different psalms. And the first one is quoting Psalm 95. And that's interesting in itself, because it doesn't say in Psalm 95 that this was a psalm of David, but the writer to the Hebrews tells us it was. So we've got additional revelation given to the writer to the Hebrews to let us know that Psalm 95 was written by David. But of course, by David and of inspiration. Now, in order to make the point that is being made there in Hebrews, the important thing here is that David, who is the person who has been inspired to write the psalm, in order to make the point, that psalm had to be written by someone who'd lived after Joshua. Because the point that's being made is that the rest that Joshua gave to the children of Israel is still, it wasn't the rest spoken of, because there is a rest still future, which David writes about in Psalm 95. So, so it had to be someone living after Joshua, and God chose to, to reveal that through David. In the next quotation, uh, in um, Matthew 22, where how then in, uh, doth David in spirit call him Lord? This is the uh, time when Jesus was confronted by the leaders of the people, whose son is he, is he the son of David? And it had to be an antecedent of the Lord Jesus Christ, didn't it? This, this person who said this, how then doth David in spirit? Notice um, what's being emphasised here as well, is although it's David, it's David being inspired, saying in David, David in spirit called him Lord. So we're getting a consistent series of, of quotations which tell us how people were being inspired. And then the final one in Acts chapter 2, which quotes Psalm 16. So the middle quote is from Psalm 110. And this quotes Psalm 16. And this had to be someone who was inspired, uh, someone inspired to whom God had given promises. David being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ. And the writer goes on, uh, Peter goes on to tell us, in that, uh, in that speech that he gave, that David was dead and buried and his sepulchre was with us unto this day. So he's not speaking about himself, he's speaking about Jesus. And he's speaking about Jesus because he's being inspired as a prophet. So I think that's where we can see how the writers become important to an extent in the message. And that's how we can look and try and understand the, the scriptures. God's choice of characters who wrote his word can be the only type of human involvement, I would suggest, in the process of, of inspiration. Now, the next uh, amount, the, the next point that Robert Ashcroft made is going to be dealt with by Brother Nigel. So I'm not going to say any more than that, other than if there were but one doubtful passage, as Brother Nigel is going to be dealing with passages which appear to be doubtful. It could no longer be said that every word in his book was inspired. Well, we'll leave that for Brother Nigel to, to comment on. And we're going to look at this next one now. Inspiration cover, covers everything in the scriptures that may have been beyond the power of man to discover for himself. Now that is a, an incredible, um, arrogant statement really, isn't it? It removes the power of 
of God to select his words. Because he's thought that, well, there are certain things that people know anyway. Why does God need to inspire people to write the things they know anyway? But you take away from God then the power that God has, has to select what he wants people to write. So divine selection is so important in the whole topic of inspiration. And um, we, we just need to uh, look at a couple of examples of this then. Um, it, it causes so many problems. What, what Robert Ashcroft's trying to do is, is um, alleviate the problems in Scripture. That's what he's trying to do. But he's creating more problems, isn't he? Because what needs to be re recorded? How would anyone know what to include and what to leave out? If you ha thought of a, an historian who's writing something and he's trying to be 100% accurate, the chances are he might not be 100% accurate in his facts that he's recording because he's liable to work because he's human. And what about this next one? The Bible is not written for um, just one age. So how would anyone who is uninspired ensure that the recording of events selection of them, even if they were 100% accurate, be relevant for future generations. And we're thinking here of, 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 of typology. And there are examples uh, of that. I'd just like to probably quickly look at, at one of them. Um, in Matthew 20, or perhaps two of them, in Matthew 22, let's just see what I'm trying to drive at here. In Matthew 22, and in verse 31... Okay, now Jesus is in conversation with the Sadducees, and he says in verse 31, But as touching the resurrection of the dead, Matthew 22, verse 31, Have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God? Uh, that's interesting, isn't it? God is speaking unto you. He's saying the Sadducees to the Sadducees, Look, God is speaking unto you. He's recorded it for you, for future generations, saying, I am the God of Abraham. And then in, in the letter to the Hebrews, and in chapter 12, And in verse 5. And ye have forgotten, he says, the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. Well, he quotes from the Proverbs. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord. But the writer to the Hebrews is saying, it's speaking to you. And it's speaking to us. Because God has caused it to be written for our learning. For correction, for instruction in righteousness, that we might be perfect, truly furnished, and to all good works. And it's a question of emphasis also, isn't it? How extensive or concise should any record be about any event? And the example that I have given in the past about this is the creation of the heavens and the earth occupy one chapter and a couple of verses in Genesis, chapter 1 and a few verses in chapter 2. They tell us the creation of the world, this massive thing, this huge thing, the creation of the heavens and the earth. And when we get to Genesis chapter 24, we have 67 verses about getting a wife for Isaac. Now, would you do that? Would you write the, the book of Genesis in that way? But God has chosen to do it in that way because he tells us enough about the creation of the heavens and the earth in Genesis. He wants to emphasise how important it is to get, a, get the right wife. And so we've got a long and detailed account of how Rebecca ends up marrying Isaac. And, and this is the wonder of the scriptures. This is what we have to keep asking ourselves as we read the scriptures. What is being um, brought to our attention here? I believe verbal inspiration <coughs> extends to order and tone, the order of the words. And, and an example of that is... Melchizedek. You know that means king of righteousness, doesn't it? But he was king of Salem. And the writer to the Hebrews commenting on that says, first king of righteousness, after that king of peace. So the order in which those words are given, Melchizedek, king of Salem, is important to the argument and how that links to the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ before he becomes king of peace.
I think it extends to tone. You know the incident when Ahab and Jehoshaphat are thinking about going to war together, and Jehoshaphat's very um, cagey about it. And so they get the prophets, and what do the prophets say? The prophets of Ahab, the false prophets, say, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the king's hand. And then the Lord's prophet, Micaiah, is brought, and he says, Go and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And immediately Ahab recognises that there's something wrong there. And it's because Micaiah will have said this in some kind of mocking tone or whatever he would have used, sarcastic tone, to show that the false prophets were not giving an accurate message. And when Jeremiah, for example, he smashes the potter's vessel, he's not going to smash it without using very stern words, very strong words. You can imagine him shouting, can't you, um, when he breaks the, the potter's vessel to have a full impact on the people. And he's inspired to do this. So we really need to think about um, the scriptures and, and, and ponder them as much as we possibly can, and, and that will reap wonderful rewards for us. So, where are the helpful sources? Well, um, as I've already said, that there's articles by Peter Watkins. Can I, can I just say, though, that, that that quote, it's the very first almost sentence, is about three sentences before. And he says this, the greatest purpose that the writings of men can fulfil is to direct people to God's word, inviting them to explore its wonders for themselves, and human works that fail to do this are useless and misleading. So we don't need to be careful what we are looking at, that the stuff that we're reading, that we spend our time looking at, is going to direct us to the Word of God. And if we don't have that kind of approach, then we can be led away, we can be led astray, and so on. So the uh, book, the, uh, La Theo Nusti, Plain Inspiration uh, of the Holy Scriptures, so that is the um, God-breathed or full inspiration of Holy Scripture. That's what he was called. It's originally written in French. Another book that I will make one quote from a little bit later is, uh, I found, much more readable than, than Gorson's book, Inspiration and Accuracy of Holy Scriptures by John Urquhart, written around about the turn of this century before the one that we've just turned. The Testimony Special Issues, um, one old one and one more recent one, and some articles in, in the first volume of, for the study and defence of Holy Scripture by Brother Edward Whittaker are also definitely worth spending some time reading. And what we need to do is to heed that proverb. It's Proverbs 19. I'd never noticed it before. I started to look at this. But cease my son is the advice of Scripture. To, to hear the instruction that causeth to err from the words of knowledge. So if there's anything out there teaching us something that is telling us that this isn't right, then we need to think about the value of, of, of continuing to read it. Um, now, let's just read a couple more quotations. We just about got five minutes, so we might just get through it. Um, some would have us believe that the prophets wrote primitive things, not acceptable to us, because they were so much creatures of their own generation. The opposite is true. They wrote things often incomprehensible to themselves or to their, and their contemporaries because they ministered to later generations. If the words of the prophets are incomprehensible to us too, it is because we are not sufficiently spiritually minded and not because we are out of touch with a primitive culture. The idea that the prophets reflected the ignorance of their age in their writings is offensive and reflects on the ignorance of those who are deceived by this wicked suggestion. Now, they're very stern words, aren't they? This, these articles were written in the early 60s. And, and no doubt, and they were all printed in the Christadelphia, no doubt because it was perceived at that time that there were people who were dabbling in certain things that he regarded as, as dangerous. There's another quote there. Now, I'm, I'm not going to read that for time, but I'm just going to say it's on the next slide. At least a summary of it is on the next slide. You'll get that quotation anyway with your free book. Um, so, what does he say? So, it's owing to the possibility 
that the scribes and translators upon whom we depend have made mistakes. Some have said uh, that God could not have been interested in transmitting a verbally precise message. Which It's a reasonable comment, isn't it? Well, if, if we've got um, a, a verbally inspired scripture, and that's been written in, in Hebrew and in Greek, and we don't have the originals anymore, and we've only got copies... And because of that, we've got translation possible difficulties and we've got transcription possible difficulties. Well, maybe verbal inspiration isn't that important. It's kind of a valid question, but actually, when you really think about it, you're actually saying to God, God, you really should have done it in a different way than you chose to do it. And I wouldn't like to say that. God has chosen to give us it in, in the way he has. And... and and we, that doesn't in any way take away from verbal inspiration. Because if verbal inspiration is a fact, it's a fact, isn't it? If it happened that God inspired people to write, even though we don't have the originals anymore, then that doesn't take away from the fact that God did it that way. And what happened subsequently, you can't remove anything about that fact. Now God says he's interested in his word, by the way. He, he made that very clear, didn't he? in every word of God is pure. And it says he's, in the Psalms, he's magnified his word above his name. Um, man is capable of copying and translating, but the message of God can only be written by being inspired. Um, the writers of scripture wrote independently of any other man, but those who translate the scripture worked in groups or teams and their work was verified and perfected at the time or maybe scrutinised many years later. So you can see the difference in direct inspiration by God to the writers and them writing it down and the other bits of, of work that has resulted in us having our Bible today. And one can't be replicated, the other one can be. And um, if inspiration was fallible, there is... No way that this can be checked out, and all attempts to correct this work are lost forever. There was no remedy to make that good, which was susceptible to error. Is that what we would expect from, from God? Now, the next slide is telling us about divine recording. And we have to just make this point very quickly. It is that not everything in Scripture, of course, are the words of God. Some are the words of men. But those words of men have been put into God's word because he wants us to know exactly what was said and what was happened. So it's just simply recording. And the fact that it is recording by inspiration means that we have an accurate record of what was said. Now, when we come back to Robert Ashcroft and his, his view, I believe he was influenced by the higher critics of his day to challenge the previously accepted doctrine of verbal inspiration, because it was generally accepted. Christadelphians had never thought that the words of God would be challenged at all. They accepted that what was written was from God. And, and what he was trying to do, in, and I won't go through those quotes, but what he was trying to do was, I believe he was caught up with events of his age, and in an attempt to defend Scripture, and I don't believe he was being mischievous, but in an attempt to defend scripture, he succeeded in undermining it. And I've read his article a number of times now, and I've come to that conclusion. He didn't doubt the existence of the Almighty. He didn't doubt the salvation provided through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. But what he did, he recognised that there were critics of the Bible. And influenced by those critics who challenged what was written not being sufficiently equipped to answer all the critics, he abandoned the doctrine of verbal inspiration, considering that by doing this, the Bible was more defendable. So, we have to allow for the fact that that's what he was trying to do, but he didn't really help matters at all. Final slide, and I should be finished now, but this final slide I will just look at now. We have to be really careful about things that are happening today. On your right, you'll see a repeat of the foundation clause with the appended scriptures. The foundation clause that was added in 1886. On the left is a statement of faith which you can find on the internet, 
And the words in blue there, um, so this is, this is all the statement, but I've highlighted the words in blue because I would need to comment on them. Following is a statement of faith representing the gospel as typically understood by Christadelphians. And the only bit that I'm going to show you is the foundation clause. And this is what they say. The Bible as defined by the Protestant canon is God's inspired word, written in the language of its times and reflecting the writer's worldview. It is the Christian's highest authority on matters of doctrine and practice. Any teaching which contradicts the following statement of faith is rejected. Now the two scriptures that are appended to that say nothing about written in the language of its times, say nothing about reflecting the writer's worldview. What justification does that bit have for being placed in the foundation clause? And furthermore, it is manifestly, I believe, deceitful to suggest that the above is a representation of the gospel understood by Christadelphians. We need to be aware of things like this. Most have not seen it, and as far as I'm aware, no ecclesia would have adopted it. We certainly wouldn't at Daventry. Uh, 